Oi oi people, Silky here, and you're listening to the Life Art Musician podcast. A podcast exploring the minds of creatives who've dedicated their lives to pursuing a career in music. The Life of Musician podcast is brought to you by Hookings Management, my artist services company that empowers our fellow DIY musicians to grow a monetized fan base without a record label. We offer a range of services such as online marketing, artist mentorship, release campaign management, videography, photography, graphic and website design, plus tons more useful services that are built to cater for independent musicians on small, self-funded budgets. Helping musicians market and monetize their art form is our passion. So if you're an artist that needs help taking your career to the next level, please feel free to reach out and get in touch via hookingsmanagement.com where you can book a video call with me for some free advice on your project. On today's episode, I'm joined by a very dear friend of mine, Mitch Aylin. Mitch is a man of many musical talents. He's the in-house producer at Woods Lodge Studios here in Essex, drummer in the incredible neo-soul band The Milk, and is also a prolific songwriter. Some of his biggest musical achievements include headlining the Shepherd's Bush Empire, a Top 40 album, a song featured in an advert for Amazon, a BBC Radio 6 Music nominated album of the year, and Mitch is also famed for playing the kazoo on Death of Guitar Pop's albums. I'm sure Mitch's insights are going to be hugely beneficial for our listener base of DIY musicians, so without further ado, let's get into it. Mitch Aylin, welcome to the Life Fire Musician podcast, my friend. Hello, mate. So, mate, um, let's get straight into it. So, yeah, the fo- first note I have is to talk about your first paid jobs in music, which I believe um, was a job in a music college and you also worked as a studio assistant. Were they your first two? Yeah, um, straight out of school, I went to work at Civic College in Benfleet as like the music, the production suite, the music suite production guy thing, you know. Um, and I worked with well, a guy called Barry Banks, who was like a decent, really good producer who was doing a bit of teaching on the side at the time. He turned it into like a really good friend of mine. And he was pretty much the, the foundation of my knowledge of like music production. And the other guy was a guy called uh, Peter Coates. It was like this virtuoso songwriter, pianist, um, London School of Music, you know, grade eight sort of level. And uh, between the two of them, it was it was almost like my education carried on, even though I was in employment. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a nice it was a nice start to life, um, you know, outside of school. And then after that. I was a runner at a studio called 750 MPH in Golden Square in Soho. And yeah, they sort of specialised in post-production, you know, audio to adverts and short films and stuff like that. And there was a few sort of one dayers in other studios, but essentially that's the, um, that's what stuck. I mean, I remember handing out my CV you know, walking around Soho with a pile of CVs and going yeah. into all these studios and, and like, come on, give us a go. And then every now and again, one would call up when their runner was off sick and you'd have to be there in an hour. Mm. And then, you know, you'd you'd do that day, you'd think it went really well and then you'd never hear from him again. Right. Um, that happened like two or three times. And then, uh, yeah, the 750 guys, I don't know, there was a particular rapport there. I got on with a lot of the, a lot of the guys who worked there and... Uh, yeah, I ended up getting like full time employment with them. Which so after running for about a year, getting coffees and teas and sushi for all around London, which is more fun than it sounds actually, because you end up like learning that part of town like the back of your end. Mm. So even now, I'm like, oh, you know, I oh, know what's on Wardour Street. There's a, there's a lovely pub down there. Do you know what I mean? It's always good on a date. You know, if you're trying to impress <laughs> someone. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was wicked. And then I got moved up to the transfer bay and the transfer bay is like the central hub studio where all audio and um, all the visual stuff for the studios, for the jobs come in and out. So it's a lot more hands on. And yeah, that's pretty much where that where that period of my life ended, you know. Right. So were you like learning the audio production side right from the start of your like professional career in these paid jobs? 
Yeah, so I always had a keen interest in it. And from my time at Civic College, um, I went on a course. You always, said, you, you always like it when I go on a course, didn't you? And uh, yeah, I just got the bug for it, fell in love with it. Like I was helping students at, at Benfleet in this, this college in, in Benfleet. I ended up doing like a few jobs with bands of students outside of the college as well. So the production um, side of my career started like really early. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the bands that I were in, I was doing all the demo stuff and, you know, we'd put out a few bits and pieces. Um, but I was just honing my craft and just, mm -hmm. you know, having a go at it, getting stuck in and, you know, really enjoying it at that period, yeah. So like um, when the Milk were first building a buzz as a band, getting record company interest, that kind of stuff. This was all around that time, was it? Or was that a little bit later on? It was a little later, but not too far. So it was after the, the college stuff. This is when I was working at 750. And uh, yeah, that's when it started to like really pick up. And we was doing loads of gigs in London at that time. And uh, yeah, you know what it's like, you know, you you do a gig sort of one week and all your fr all your pals are there in front row. And then like a couple of weeks later, there was like a load of people you didn't know. And you're like, oh, this is something's happening here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was around, yeah, that sort of time, 2009, I'd say, 2010. That's when it proper kicked in. And that's when I left 750 because we all decided as a group that we're going to throw our lives into the milk and really, you know, give it, give it a go. Yeah. So when you were when you were doing those like um, those early jobs that were sort of in in the sort on the production side of things, like what was your mindset at the time? Was it like right, better do this because I like it. It's still in music, but like really because the because the milk got together so young and you were already together at that point and working really hard at the band. Was your mindset like, right, if I if I can sort of carve a bit of a career path as a producer, then that's a good uh, fallback plan for if the band doesn't doesn't work, but the band was like the, the sort of the main priority in your mind and you wanted that to be full time? Or was it just a little bit more open than that and you, and you didn't really know at that point? You just enjoyed doing the band, you enjoyed doing the production and was just sort of doing them to the best of your abilities and seeing what what you know would would end up working out and building the most momentum for you yeah yeah i understand I, it's a bit of both it's a bit of both it's i definitely felt that the milk was the top priority right you know i still harbored ambitions of being this fucking rock star and was that like right from the age of like 15 16 i think so mate yeah, yeah. as soon as you see oasis at main road you know it's like there's no going back really <laughs> it, weren't, <laughs> it weren't for me but at the same time, I was sort of, you know, I, I had enough about me to think that this is pretty fucking unlikely. But at the same time, I, you know, falling back on a life in music production ain't so much of a fallback. Do you know what I mean? I knew I wanted to do music regardless. So I was going to find my little, you know, I was going to carve my little, you know, avenue out of this industry one way or another. Because, I, you know, not only was I not interested in anything else, I was pretty fucking shit at everything else. Do you know what I mean? I worked on a building site on my dad for a few months. I was useless at that. Um, I never really got an office job, but I fucking, I couldn't, you know, I didn't know what Excel was. So I was like, well, that really ain't for me. Um, so I'll stay in this music game and work something out, you know, by hook or by crook. The other thing to remember as well is, is that, you know, it was around then that the industry was changing. So even if, I don't know, Put it this way, it was, it was really hard to just be the drummer in a band and call that your job for the next 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. You know, you had to have a few different fingers in pies. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think back in the 60s, if the band would have done well, I'd have just been the drummer in yeah. in the band. But it's not really, you know, the, 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 the climate was changing. So learning more about music production and, you know, what ended up being post-production with advertising and then, like writing bespoke for stuff like that it was all part of what i call my career which is like an overall just career in audio and you know sound basically yeah interesting so when the milk um got signed was that sort of just like after or the back end of the sort of guitar music boom of the 90s or was that sort of midway through that do you know what i mean because i certainly felt like 
um, at, at times in my old band, um, states of emotion, we we felt like you know what watching some of those bands like um build all that momentum so quickly and then go on to have full-time careers as artists all right a lot of those bands didn't sustain those in the end um there's only very few that have gone on to be like huge you know what i mean like a Arctic monkeys mm. killers kasabian or whatever um but but i remember feeling I, and maybe this was just um you know naive of me but but looking at bands blowing up and uh around that time and guitar music being so popular in in mainstream culture i actually saw being an a full-time artist as as a route that was like realistic i mean i mm. look back now and, and sort of laughed you know what i mean um but so did you did you always have a sense of like feeling as though you could be the the or looking at it, approaching your rear, like you could be the full-time drummer in the milk and that could be your thing. Did you always have reservations about that? Do you know what I mean? And doubts that that could be like sustainable? Um, yeah, I did. I mean, that's why I started getting into music production. I mean, I wanted that to happen, but I just yeah. knew that the margins, like the, the percentages of people that have that opportunity, like you say, to mm. do that for the rest of their lives. I mean, even if we'd have had like a couple of, you know, hits in that period, I think the evidence suggests that you've then got to find something else to do after it because it's mm. just not sustainable. You know, like you say, you're talking about the elite, you're talking about like your, your Arctic Monkeys, Libertines maybe, Oasis, you know, these massive things that are these juggernauts of, of acts that, you know, live in the consciousness of all of us. It's such a privileged place to be. And, you know, we all wanted it, you know, I wanted mm. it, but the likelihood, you know, the likelihood of it was, was, was slim. And I think I recognized that. But having said that, the other side of that coin is that we were a fucking great band mm. and like we sold out rooms for fun. And, you know, the singer in our band, Rick's like fucking top draw, mate. Do you know what I mean? Top draw. And we were writing like some sick songs. And around that period, we just had, um, we'd done like nine separate tours in Russia which, all right, it's, it's a dirty word now. But back then it was this really exciting place that was, you yeah. know, it felt like this new frontier of like music. Do you know what I mean? People yeah, were huge. like loving British and Western music. And we met these guys and we got flown out there and like Oasis done a few gigs with the same chaps. The Strokes were taken out there. And all of a sudden we were we were out there doing all these gigs and we, we done like these massive um, festivals with like Brett Anderson and Supergrass. Mm. And uh, it was just fucking wicked. And like, you know, you'd have all these, you'd be signing autographs for fans. And mm. I'd be thinking like, what the fuck is going on? So we we had all of this, this energy and this like, you know, ambition and belief that this could cross over into, you know, back home. And uh, I think that's what kept us going. But, you know, and I, I wasn't thinking about being a producer then. When we was right mm. in the heart of it, I was like, no, nah, let's, let's do this like full on. Yeah, because you've got to really, haven't you? Yeah. Like yeah. you've got to attack it full throttle, haven't you? And, and yeah i think that um that that's what i was going to ask you so even with all that really exciting um stuff happening and all that momentum you were building even in 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 those moments were you did you have a sensible enough mindset a grounded enough mindset of this is awesome and there's a really good chance that this could end up growing into something massive and this can be my full-time job but I should always have that fallback plan of the production and the other things that I'm good at in music and I enjoy in music just in case. Like, were there, were there periods, do you feel like, where you weren't, like, kind of safeguarding it with that mindset? You were mm. just completely, like, caught up in, like, wow, this is going to be massive. Well, there's a couple of things. I think I had a lot, a lot of support from my parents as well, which I think was a massive thing. Like, you know, I spent a, two, a couple of years with a bird in north london for a bit but the majority of that period of my life i was living at home yeah so there was a financial pressure that i didn't have which allowed me to do this sort of stuff and um you know my mum and dad were really supportive you know i yeah. kind of said i want to be a rock and roll drummer and they were like well go on then you know wicked and um yeah i mean i was incredibly privileged to have that support and also luke's the bass player in the band he's my brother so half of the band had this like great support and the other two did to be fair um the other thing to say as well is that none of us, we're all quite smart lads, do you know what I mean? Like outside of the band, Rick was a teacher, Dan was 
like a successful sales salesman at a pharmaceutical company at the time, I think. Luke was working for, he was a computer programmer at NatWest. So, you know, we all had these other careers that was going on. But like I say, with me, it was slightly different because to fall back on music production and music writing, is like, well, if that don't work, I'll, I'll just be a footballer after that. And if, <laughs> and if the football don't work out, then I'll be an F1 driver. <laughs> do, you, do you know what I mean? So I did, I did that production stuff and I was working in, you know, I, picking up coffees for marketing execs, you know, all around Soho. That was my fallback plan, but it was a pretty sick fallback plan yeah. as well. Because I didn't, I, like, I can't stress enough. I, 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 I didn't really know anything else. I had no interest in, it must be some sort of ADHD I've got, but without interest in something, I've got, I, you know, I've no, you know, yeah. I've got no interest in doing it whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But this music thing, this sound thing, it kept me motivated. It kept me, you know, excited so i just stayed i stayed on that path man i stayed on the bus it's, it's interesting because that uh what you've just said about you have to be like highly stimulated um by something mm. to 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 kind of stay with it do you know what i mean and um yes yeah, so basically your work has to highly stimulate you for 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 it to be like a sustainable thing for you uh, that's becoming like a bit of a running theme for this podcast like every guest i sit down with um pretty much um yeah like articulates what what you just have and i certainly feel um the same do you know what i mean that's there, there, there's there's really something to be said in that isn't it mm. isn't there do you know what i mean it's I, I me personally like when i was at school i was one of them kids that i'd been like top set for english history um and and then like bottom for for maths and science because mm. it just didn't fucking interest me or, mm -hmm. or stimulate me do you know what i mean i wasn't like I think most kids are pretty consistent across the board, aren't they? They're either top set in everything or middle in everything or bottom in everything. But um, yeah, for me, like if I was really interested in something, then I would be working harder than anyone else in, in the classroom and, 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 and in it, do you know what I mean? Whereas if something didn't interest me at all, um, you know, I, I, I was lazy, like mm. really, really lazy at it. Um, yeah, would you say that you're you're the same then? I was exactly the same, mate. Yeah. I, was in, I was in the top set at school all the way to like year nine, so I wasn't an idiot. But then, yeah, when it comes to like maths and science, I ended up having like a tutor at home in order to sit me down and yeah. like drill it into me, um, you know, what I needed to do to pass these exams. But when it comes to like English, music, I was doing like drama, I think was one of my choices, media studies. Yeah, I was, I was good as gold because I, mm. I found that stuff interesting, but... Yeah, and I've sort of carried that into my work. I mean, the other thing as well worth mentioning, and this, you know, I don't. This really is like a defining like memory in my life. Is that my old man was a is like one of the hard work hardest working geezers that I've ever known, right? And he's always worked in the building game. And I remember as a kid, I can still see him walk through the back door now, completely covered in fucking shit, and say to me like, "Don't you ever do this for a living?" Sort of thing. Like, make sure you find something that you want to do. And look, my brother ended up being a builder. Dad's still a builder now, and they're like supremely successful. This is no like beef on builders, do you mm. know what I mean? And I did it for a you know a number of years, months or whatever. But like I, for me, it was the music thing. It was the audio thing, and you know, I, it was very clear to me that I didn't want to spend the rest of my life because I'm gonna I'm gonna be working the rest of my life. It has to be like something that I really, really love doing. And even if it takes me longer to get there than other people, even if I'm skint for you know twice as long mm. as my pals you know which ended up being the case i'm just gonna stay on the bus as they say i'm gonna just stay on course you know mm. and um you know it's worked out all right in one way or, or, or another but uh yeah i just always had that kind of i don't know intuition i suppose that kind of i mean i'm not mature in a lot of areas <laughs> of my life but when it comes to like how i spend the minutes of, of my time alive i was pretty on it do you know what i mean mm. i wanted to make sure it was i was always doing something i liked yeah and you have got an incredible work ethic that you've obviously inherited from your old man do you know what i mean because when we've been in here you will go like fucking 15 16 hours on a session like no problem on a you know different I mean? guitar pop session <laughs> <laughs> but it's like you know and and 
you are often in here like till silly o'clock, aren't you? Yeah. I know that like, you know, as, as you get a bit older, you want a bit more work-life balance. So you've probably got a bit more discipline with that as time's gone on. But I guess as well, when you're starting out, you've got the financial pressure as well, haven't you? And if, 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 and you need to prove yourself, do you know what I mean? So if that's what it's going to take, do you know what I mean? To, to get the, the best work out of you and to bring home the bacon, then, you know, you have to just work these mad hours in the beginning. And I guess a lot of the artists that, that come in here have got day jobs and everything. So you're having to do sessions at weekends and evenings and things like that. So, yeah, I think, you know, you, you need to be someone that's very, very passionate about your work and very, very stimulated by your work. Um, to make a success out of like a, a career like what you and I have chosen, right? I, Matt, I couldn't agree more. You've kind of got oh, you got to earn it. You know, it's, mm. it's all right saying I want to do it, but you got to you got to really put in those hours. Um, and yeah, it's a bit better these days because I'm married. <laughs> uh, but even now, man, you know, I can be it's, it's common. I'm here seven, eight o'clock most nights. You know, um, yeah. And like you say, when it's like stuff that needs to be done, I mean, I've done a few adverts in the past where it's been signed off in America and I've been lingering around here till about 10 o'clock at night for them to sign it off. And only then <laughs> I've, I've been given the go ahead to do like all the versions or the cut downs. So you turn like a three minute track into like a 30 second, a 20 second, a 60 second, and you do it all again, but instrumental, then you do it all again, but underscore, yeah. you do a sting, an alternate version, ends up being like, 30 files that you send off and it all takes time so i'm in here till two three in the morning yeah you know getting it all signed off and it's i don't know it sounds like a like a drag man do you know what i mean but it's actually quite exciting do you know mm. what i mean especially when you've got news that you've got this mm. you know great advert you know and um so yeah there's, there's been a few times i've been in here till to the to the wee hours wasn't the boss shingle weren't you mixing that yeah. to like <laughs> yeah that, that was another one <laughs> yeah these boys are like yeah it's got to be done like it's, it's got it's got to be mastered on friday and this was wednesday night and i'm thinking all right so it's got to be done tonight then uh but yeah i love it you know it's what, whatever needs to be done like i say i think you gotta i don't know it's working for yourself as well isn't it do you know what i mean mm. like I'd, I'd in order for for me to carry on doing what i'm doing and to keep progressing you know, I'm more than happy to put those hours in. If if all of those hours were going in for someone else, then I'd probably begrudge it a bit more. But it's yeah. all for me and my family and this studio and, you know, the bands who I, who I work with who, you know, more often than not, I love to death and I want to see do really successful. So mm -hmm. they'll be really successful. So it's all good, man. I've got I've got no complaints. Mm -hmm. So so let's talk about the milk first getting signed. Um, so yeah, how did that all come about and yeah, how old were you and like, what did it feel like? Cause that's, that I don't think is, is, I don't think signing a record deal is this like huge, like, um, milestone moment as much as it was back mm. then. Now I think, you know, artists are doing so much more independently now and, um, yeah, those kind of dream record deals of the past um, aren't really so much of a thing anymore. Mm. But when you guys signed, getting signed was a fucking big deal, wasn't it? Do mm. you know what I mean? So, yeah, let's talk a bit about that. Yeah. Um, so I think it was different, like you say. It was a, a big deal. We didn't have, like, all of the... I mean, Facebook was around... I think it was all... Yeah, it, this was sort of 2011 we got signed. So all of them platforms were around, but they were different versions of themselves you know um so that that way of like putting yourself out there was it's not as accessible as it is now i'll say that so this this idea that there's this you know gatekeeper of the music industry that, that sort of answers all your prayers kind of still existed a bit um not as much as it did 10 years prior but a lot more than it does sort of now you know what yeah I mean? so it felt like um a necessity you know signing over you know to a, to a label felt like a necessity to, to really push on. And we'd just had a, we'd had a, um, we'd signed to an independent deal. We'd done a couple of singles uh, with a with a label called Name Edge. We put out Danger and I think B-Roads. Um, and then that went quite well, not in terms of record sales, but just the, the heat around the band sort of picked up. And it ended up, you know, Sony caught whiff of us, if you like. 
And uh, yeah, from that period on, if I remember, there was just like a load of showcases that went on. We had meetings with like Atlantic and, you know, a lot of the big boys, I think, you know, Chrysalis, I think we, we had a meeting with, but it was Sony that kind of rose to the top and their interests sort of really um, come through. And then it all accumulated to, so yeah, like I said, was, was doing like these gigs in London mainly and more people were turning up every time we was there and we'd get wind from our manager that, oh, such and such is here from whatever label. And it, was, it felt like that for about six months a year. And then it all culminated to a gig at the Jazz Cafe. And uh, we were told that all of the labels, they're all literally, they're all here and they're all up on the balcony, you know, eating steak or whatever. <laughs> and, you know, they're going to decide whether they want you or not. And so it's like a fucking audition. It, basically. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically, man. And it was a, we had a, we had a festival that night and we ordered like rented this Winnebago. It ended up being like the greatest weekend of our lives because <laughs> after that, after the gig, we found out at this festival that Sony wanted to do it. But then it's not done until you sign that paperwork, mm. is it? So I think I think we waited for like another three or four months after that. And we missed like our mates stag dues and all this sort of stuff around that period, I remember. Because, you know, we had to stay in town just in case they go, right, we want you to sign it today. We didn't want to miss any opportunity. And then uh we was out in um where was we? We was over it was up in Angel and there's a there's a post box outside of I think the Weatherspoons there. And uh, that's where we signed the deal. Our manager turned up with it in his hand and we all went in his well, phone box at about three, <laughs> three in the morning and signed our lives away. So Fucking hell, man. It was, it was dead exciting and it was, yeah, man. I mean, I've, that period, it was like, I thought I'd, I thought I'd done it. I mean, as, as it turns out, there was a lot more to do, you know. Sure. But yeah, it was, a, it was an exciting period for sure. And like the milk are independent now, but... Um is it fair to say that that like that first album cycle where sony was behind you do you feel like they did a pretty good job uh it was a double-edged sword i mean we've spoke about this loads mm. but i remember hearing stories about bands signed to majors and they were like oh you know you've got to be careful you know and i was, I was just thinking you fuck, shut up like it's, mm. it must be incredible it's like all your aunts yeah dreams being answered and you know but but then you're finally there and reality kind of hits home and I mean, what Sony was great for was, I mean, they they invested in our project. Um, you know, we got ourselves into places that we'd never otherwise get into. And we met people, you know, on the same, you know, for the same reason. It was like, there's a certain amount of like, they've got access to that through that glass ceiling. The network thing. The yeah, network, huge, man, yeah. you know, they can, they can hit buttons and things happen. And... Um, you know, we made a load of new fans because of their investment, but you know, the downsides to that are is that you're you're thrown into an environment of like A and R people. Um that you know, you, you assume know know how to work this and, and they've got like a, a strategy in order to, you know, really make this like succeed. And that I suppose that's one of our biggest regrets is that is that assumption because I've learned since that no one knows your project more than you do, and you've got to trust your instincts and your intuition with stuff like that. And uh, I mean, one of the best, you know, articulations of that is that we was talking about we was in a meeting in Sony Records and we was talking about uh, a music video for our latest single, and I don't think we was getting enough. Sort of radio play. Radio play was really important at the time. Radio One. Oh my God, you got to get played on Radio One. Mm. Uh, got to get played on Radio One or you're dead. You know, you're finished. So it was like this enormous pressure, you know, and, and we, the other singles hadn't done as much as we wanted to at that, at that point. So they wanted us for our next music video to go down to Oxford Circus, mime to our track and take all of our clothes off. <laughs> and... <laughs> and you know we were sitting in this meeting at sony records that we've been dreaming of being at for mm. you know best part of 15 years of our life and we're looking around at each other and you know, i remember looking at rick and going did he just it's fucking he ridiculous said, yeah. isn't it and he was like <laughs> and they're and they're, and they're all sort of nodding their head you know the way that the simpsons would like articulate that yeah. kind of corporate office and they're all going mm, yeah that's it was like that and we we're going this is a joke <laughs> it's a like a wind up yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> beetle's gonna come out you know <laughs> And uh, we just was like, no, I'm, I'm afraid that's all wrong. You know, we are yeah. not going to go down to Oxford, Oxford Street and take our clothes off. Are you mad? You know, 
And it was those moments of like real disappointment uh, uh, like that, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, looking back on the whole, it's, 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 it was a positive experience because then it kicked us off to sign with Wild Wild 45, which is really cool independent soul jazz label so was that the second album onwards that's so that's favorite worry and mm -hmm. cages and uh you know a lot of the legwork had been done for a label in terms of the investment the the fan base you know we've, we had a email listing you know as long as your arm you know it was we were kind of known was getting some good radio play was playing festivals it was like a it was a fully formed mm. you know machine do you know what i mean it just needed another company to sort of take it over um, which they did, so you know it's, it, all, it all works out for a reason, doesn't it? And so, like, what were the like the ups and downs of doing the milk as a full time venture? Like, how many years were you doing it full time? Um, yeah, and just like, what, what were the what were the highlights and what was tougher about trying to make it work full time? Um, you mentioned earlier about how you know your mates were off on on. Um, stag do's that you couldn't do because you had to sacrifice um leisure like so that you could make sure that you were like available for opportunities you wait mm. for your record deal to go through at the time um i know from my experience actually was we got signed in our um sort of like mid-20s and um you know our friends that had all sort of got their head down and cracked on in conventional careers um, since coming out of school. They were starting to get ready to buy a house and things like that. And we were just like way behind in, 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 the, in the sort of pecking order. Do you know what I mean? Because we'd mm. sacrificed so much, um, you know, to, to get good as a band and hopefully get that break, get that opportunity in music. So, yeah, I can imagine there was there was times like like that that were difficult. So, yeah, just uh, just what were the, yeah what were the ups and downs at that time well financially mate i mean there's, there was no getting around it we were i mean we signed an hundred grand record deal right which is was almost, that what it was hundred grand on the button pretty much it was under it was hundred grand with a 50 grand um uh tour support in place but it was so, a, so sorry you had a hundred grand advance that was yeah. for you to like take as your own and then a 50 grand separate tour support to yeah. go and lose on the road and finance the, the exactly. promotional stuff live exactly yeah uh but we, we was on a 360 deal which were fairly new back then mm. um, they were really frowned upon back in the day weren't they 360s i think nowadays um it's become more kind of like commonplace mm. because um of there being you know less and less money in record sales because of the streaming thing and that but i remember back then they were quite frowned upon weren't they the 360 yeah, deals exactly i mean it's, it's it's a tough one to you know to take when the record label's taking you know a, a good wedge of your live um income you know the the argument is is that you wouldn't have all those people there at those gigs if it weren't for the investment that the label made in terms yeah. of making your albums I, I totally get it but it was brand new, so you had to get your head around it, you know. Um, and yeah, I mean, the the money sounds like a lot now. Again, it's, it's sort of, but it wasn't a lot sort of 10 years prior to that, but it's a lot now sort of thing. And it was very much a development deal. Um, um, yeah, and it had to support, what, four four lads in the band and our manager at the time. Mm. And we were doing it full time for about three years, I think, in the end. So That's the thing. It's, it's, it sounds, it is impressive on paper for a, a company to to give a brand new artist, um, you know, £100,000 and an extra 50 grand to go and finance the growth on the road. But as you say, when you break it down... Um, that money doesn't go that far, does it? Do you know what I mean? Between four lads and a manager who's taking commission for that, for mm -hmm. helping, like, uh, you know, you guys, uh, helping bring that opportunity to the table, it doesn't go that far. So, like, signing and, you know, getting 150 grand off Sony, I'm sure there'll be some, like, younger artists out there listening to this that think, you know, like, to mm -hmm. get 150 grand off Sony, do you know what I mean? You've, you've, you've cracked it, but when it's got to stretch out over three years between not a lot. five people. And and I, I would imagine as well, you probably didn't, you couldn't commit to having like any type of regular job to help subsidize that either, could you? Because 
you might get a, like an email or a phone call one week to say, right, you're off supporting fucking Paul Weller or whoever mm. for like two dates next week in Scotland or so you couldn't you couldn't commit to a regular job, could you? Like No, no, none of us had regular jobs mm. at that point. We'd we'd actually given up a year before we got signed as this big like right almost like pirates together, like all of us, yeah. to, all, here we go, we're going to fucking do this. Do you know what I mean? So we'd already been unemployed for like a year by the time we got signed. So the whole thing was probably like, it's closer to four years really. But yeah, I mean, financially, I've never been more skint in my life. Really, yeah. Because yeah, we couldn't have had any other jobs outside of it. We were touring like ferociously. Our first tour was six weeks on the road, just in the UK. Like six weeks, like like every was that headline like tour, every was it? day, yeah. Well, yeah, it was our own headline tour, but we literally played every town, every venue, like going. I mean, I I know pubs in most villages on this land, <laughs> you know. Uh, and it was wicked. It was like you know, boys away, like scat camp or whatever. It, yeah. was. it was just like en- six endless week long stag yeah. do. Basically, <laughs> I think we had like we had like five days off in the middle of it, but essentially it was just fucking carnage. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Um, but the other thing was we was, you know, we was acutely aware of like holding on to this opportunity that we'd been given. So we were like in here every other day, writing for our next record, making sure that that had every opportunity to push us on to the next step, you know, and, uh, yeah, throw in like, we'd, we'd always do these like weird sort of, I don't know, there'd be like a, a new fucking clove shop opening in Carnaby street and we'd be the band in there doing an acoustic set or. I don't know, there'd be festivals going on or there, there was always, we was, I remember being kept really, really busy making music videos, um, doing some session for Spotify. There was always, there was no room to have another job. Do you know what I mean? So it all yeah. just meant that you was plowing everything into this project. And, you know, like you say, it sounds like a lot of money, but when you, when, when you divide it up into those people into that amount of time, it really wasn't. So, um, yeah. And like you said earlier, you know, you, you, your friends who you know and love and grew up with, they're all getting like, you know, married and getting mortgages and all this sort of business. And, you know, you're there sort of still writing songs. And I think I was, I don't know, 28 at the time. So, you know, when you start moving into your thirties, you know, the you start thinking like, well, what am I doing? You know mm. what I mean? But kind of what I said earlier, I was pretty stubborn in that respect. I was just like, no, stay on the bus, you know, stay in it. Mm. And whilst we were signed to Sony, it was, it was fucking great because, you know, of all those things we were, I mean, uh, you know, I'm going to drop a few names now, but like one of the biggest ones, we, we, we went to, we met Elton John, it was, was it a, an Elton John, one of his Christmas do's that it turns out he does every year. And like the guy was just, you know, he'd sit down at our table and chat with us for 20 minutes. And Amazing. Like, we ended up back to, I think, Johnny Greenwood's like flat in like, it was just like crazy mm. times, you know. And uh, whilst all these like mad opportunities were happening, was thinking like, well, I'll, be skint for a bit it don't it don't really matter you know so so sort of would you say then like in summary like the ups for all that cool stuff that you fucking dream about as a teenager you know hanging out with elton john being on the road with your best mates um you know just all the adrenaline fueled like being on music video shoots and everything where you're being like you know really looked after and made a fuss of and um that, that that was the kind of cool, fun element. And then also the experience you're gaining from mm. being out on the road and, and getting the opportunity to to get better of, uh, at your craft as a live band is is huge. But the, the tough thing, the underlying thing is the financial thing. You haven't mm. got the fucking rock star wages to, to mm. match. Would you say that that was the... But even if like, you know, you hear stories about the Beatles, about how successful they were, but there was still nothing in their bank account. At least they kind of knew that that money was coming. Yeah. Whereas we were still on, you know, was was get, you know, through that period, we was getting better and was getting more successful, but it was a slow gradient. Do you know what I mean? There wasn't Mm. like these moments where you've just sold 100,000 records. I'd be like, oh, fine. Well, at least, you know, that's coming further down the line. There was still this thing that we were frantically holding on to. Do you know what I mean? And it caused some fractions within the band because mm. up until that point, you know, you're in a band with these chaps for 10 years prior and it's your it's your thing to do away from work and away from, you know, whatever stresses and press, pressures that you, that you had. Whereas now it's very much the stress. It's very much the sure. pressure. So 
your pals suddenly become your like workmates slash like colleagues. Yeah, I like mean by business def- partners. Yeah, by default you become business partners, yeah. don't you? Which is a bit fucking strange when yeah, yeah it's and your one of them's my brother and- for yeah. goodness sake, and it's like you know. I'm not saying we're like Liam and Noel, far from it, but you know, we were allowed to say things to each other that otherwise don't get said amongst friends. Yeah. And it was just, it's weird. I mean, I'm so close with the other two as well. It was pretty much brothers anyway. So yeah, the, the, the relationship started to change quite quickly and under a lot of pressure. And it was, it was difficult at times, you know, it's a testament that we're still together now, given Mm. everything that we went through. Um, and I love them dearly. Of course I do. So, so yeah, let's talk a bit about how Woods Lodge Studios came to be. Um, so it started as like a rehearsal space for the Milk, uh, and now it's Essex's version of uh, Rockfield. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, it's under refurb at the minute, but it certainly will be. Um, yeah. So when did it start? Yes, exactly that. It was it was a little uh, granny annex that my dad bought on the side of his place, and uh, was like, oh, you should turn that into a studio at least for us to sort of knock about in and write this you know write these tunes for our band and yeah when the sony thing happened um sort of come to an end then all of that like day-to-day stuff that we were doing obviously started to fall apart not fall apart fall away so we all had to find other things to do with our you know with our days and yeah my one the best opportunity that i thought i had in front of me was to um turn woods lodge into a local recording studio and the other thing i do on the side of um producing bands and artists is i do a lot of like writing for tv you know media commercial film stuff like that and the way i got into that was through the the recording studio i used to work for prior to the band getting signed and just before we got signed and threw all of our like hearts into the band um a production music company, a library company, who I love dearly, called Deep East. Um, I was really friendly with the two directors, similar age to me, you know, proper like gung-ho, like cowboys out there, like mixing it up in that industry full of like, you know, big boys like BMG, Universal, you know. And they were making like real, real headway in the production music like world. And I was the guy at the studio who would take their music and then, you know, give it to a engineer in a studio. And that would end up being on like a advert for fucking Land Rover or whatever. So I ended up getting really friendly with them. And when I left that studio, and again, prior to the band getting signed, I said to the guys, I said, look, I could do some of this music. It was like guitar fucking 60 second hitters. You know what I mean? I was, yeah. you know, a little soul ditty or whatever. And I was like, let me have a go. So I'd done 10 tracks for them. And then that actually made me a few quid in a, in a, in a, in a in a barren world of, you know, no cash, <laughs> I suddenly got this royalty from them a couple of years down the road of, of like a few grand. And I was like, wow. So that's, I'll keep an eye on that because that could mm. be something I'd do in the future. So when I opened up Woods Lodge, I ended up obviously getting as many bands as I could in to, to record and write and, you know, just produce and engineer them, but also write as many of these like production music tracks as I possibly could. And because I had more time to myself than not back then, I ended up like like knocking out anything between like 40 and 70 tunes a year, all of which went on to like generate, you know, a royalty over time. Do you know what I mean? A lot of those songs from back then still pull in a few quid now. Not a lot, but it still just trickles in. These, mm. these It's like so many years down the line. So I thought between that and obviously producing other bands, there might be a, Again, there might be a little career here to, yeah. to be had. So, and yeah, that's kind of how it started. And that was 10 years ago. That was 2013. So, I mean, yeah, let's just talk a little bit more about the, um, like the catalogue music writing. So like how that works as a business, because this is like a kind of niche area of the music business that I don't have um, much knowledge on, um, but I know I've, I've picked your brains about it a few times. So you have like a sort of publishing deal, don't you? Um, and get sent briefs and you'll get like um, a fee for taking the project on. And then if one of the songs get synced, you then get the royalties. Is that pretty much like, you know, the fundamentals of how that works? Yeah, that's that's pretty accurate. I mean, in that world, for me, there's, there's two sort of, um, there's two 
ways to go about it. One is the production music stuff, which is exactly that. I get given a brief. The music is signed to the publisher, not the writer, which is essential for me because I write for other people, you know, up to and including the milk. Do you know what I mean? So I can't have any of those. I can't. There can't be any distortion in terms of me being like, attached to any one label, for example, any one publisher. So the music is signed, not the writer. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, I get given a brief, anything, you know, three to 10 tracks on any given sort of genre that I'm you know, attributed to. So it's like guitar music, soul music, you know, I've done some some reggae, some electronic stuff that I really enjoy doing, um, you know, all sorts really, but more so live music given the studio and, and my skill set. And then, yeah, you send it off, it gets approved, it goes on a catalog and then when, I don't know, the Discovery Channel or ITV or fucking some film, you know, want that style of music, but they want to pay through their nose for like, you know, real commercial music. They end up using this stuff, this production music stuff. And uh, yeah, it's, it's like a little dark sort of music industry underneath the music mm -hmm. industry, you know. And the other way is bespoke. Uh, so I'll, I've got, a, you know, a good relationship with a handful of companies that call me up and go, Mitch, you know, uh, whatever, Budweiser want like something that sounds a bit sort of Amy Winehouse, but a bit sort of Jack White -y in places, you know, can you do it? And I'm like, I'll have a swing at it. And I'll, I'll usually get a demo fee for having a swing at it. And obviously if it then gets used, there's a licensing fee. There'll be royalties if I've, uh, you know, writing royalties if I've, if I've written the thing. And the, what I get out of that all depends on the size of the campaign, what it's used on, whether it's on, it could be TV for two weeks or it could be TV radio online for six months. It could be globally, it could be just in, I don't know, France. And it, this all depends on what I earn off the back of it, you know? So they're the two sort of ways that that, that works. And yeah, I think it's just by reputation. You do, you do one, it goes well. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, I suddenly turn into become that guy who's good at that style of music. So then I'll get asked to, to do it a lot more basically would you say like the pros of that is obviously um you know there's the royalties on a track can pretty much be evergreen um if it keeps getting synced so you're creating like a really great like passive income stream for yourself um but the cons of it are that it's not predictable in that like um you're waiting for your PRS statement to come in and you're never really sure exactly. Uh, is it hard to project what your income is going to be on your PRS? Impossible. Mm. Uh, I mean, it really is. And I kind of set a threshold, not through any kind of uh, knowledge at the time, but I kind of had a threshold of like, if I can earn that every quarter, yeah, that'd be wicked. Do you know what I mean? And that'll set me up for doing my production stuff, any milk stuff on top of that. Sweet. And then sometimes it spikes and it's like, fuck, you know, what's happened? And then you go through your statement and, you know, 10 of your tracks have been used in Brazil like all day long, you know, or whatever. And you're like, wow, that's fantastic. And then other times it sort of slightly dips below. So it's really hard to, yeah, calculate what I actually earn mm. on any given year. But I don't know. As long it, it kind of all, as, it, as I've learned, it all kind of evens itself out anyway. Yeah. And, and I guess now you're getting like demo fees, that helps as well, because at least, you know, you're being compensated for your time on mm. the track, whether it ends up getting synced and earning royalties or not. You're actually getting paid for your time to, to make the track in the first place. Yeah. Um, which wasn't always the case, you know. Yeah. I don't know Is that something you have to work up to sort of thing in, in the fees? Um, guess so i'm not sure i can't remember how I, I don't know i think any sort of production company worth their soul uh, you know it's like a respect to the writer respect to the musician i mean it's been, i've been asked to do quite big production things and um you know even with a demo fee you know they've kind of um asked for horn sections and string sections and i'm just like look realistically this isn't going to happen i mean unless you want me to fudge around on a fucking saxophone <laughs> Yeah, you, know, uh, you know, to get people in to do it, they don't give a shit. They, you know, it's their, it's their living. Yeah, they yeah, they, they course, want to get paid the day for it. Rate, yeah. Is it coming out of my pocket to mm. then not get this further down the line? It's like, you know, it's tricky. Um, and you, you take each job as it comes. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Um, but I, I, I don't ever remember demanding like a demo fee. I'm not, I refuse to play a note, you know, mm. <laughs> until I get paid. It was none of that. It was just, I don't know. I think it's just the respect come from, 
those music houses. And yeah, if- and as you build your um, sort of like, uh, what's the word, like portfolio, I guess, of yeah. like songs and that, you can demand a little bit more like... That kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, if someone said, can you have a go at this? And it's like, you know, a week's worth of work, like of my time, but we're not going to give you anything for it. You know, it's not going to get me excited to be a part of it. So if they want me to be a part of it, you know, they've got to kind of excite me. You know what I mean? So yeah, just like to get a bit more of an insight into how it all works financially, because I feel like there might be some like aspiring producers, um, song like slash songwriters that are listening, that are trying to make that transition and go full time like you've um, been able to successfully do. Would you say that like you, the work that you do in house as a producer? Um, getting the artists in and 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 recording, that's your kind of solid like bread and butter earnings because you know what you're getting like um, you know by the hour and if you get X amount of bookings, you're sorted. Do you know what I mean? Um, and then the and then the um, the songwriting, which you know comes quarterly, is it from PRS? That's a way of of boosting the earnings and and creating something more passive and it's not uh, the potential in that is also huge um, because there's no real ceiling as to what you could earn if, if a track keeps getting synced. But do you, does it, does it kind of make this sustainable? Um, be, like, and, and um, does it, does it, does it kind of take the pressure off the fact that you've got both like the, the different setups there and that in, in one case, you're essentially like a work for hire and you know if you get a certain amount of bookings, you can earn X. Um, but then the other one's got a lot more potential um, in terms of what it, what it could earn you, but isn't as reliable because you never really know what you're getting like per quarter. It's exactly that, mate. It literally is exactly that. And like I said, when I first opened the studio, there wasn't a queue of bands wanting to work with me. Do you know what I mean? Because I just started. There was a handful that you know knew that I was Mitch from The Milk and they thought it'd be fun to you know cut a record with me, but... Yeah, it, it wasn't a busy studio back then, so I just front-loaded it with all of that like writing and, and library stuff. That these days is a bit different, actually, because it's it's a lot more, there's more bands and artists in here that want to work with me, so there's less time for me to do that writing stuff. So it, it really just depends on how busy the diary is. Um, but yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I'll just be repeating, be, repeating what you said. You, 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 there's a fantastic opportunity that one of your tracks gets used on some fucking massive Netflix ad, uh, whatever, you know, promo thing. And you make a shitload of money, but you, again, you, you can't be sort of, you can't be betting on that to happen in, in terms of your income. So it's all about the balance between the two, but also, you know, again, to just to keep me, you know, enthralled on what I'm doing. I think if I'd done any, if I done too much of any one thing, I'd want to mm. be doing the other. So a nice sort of healthy balance of all of it um, works for me for sure. And it's a bit like, you know, the whole, you know, you, you need a few fingers in your pies. I mean, essentially I work here at Woods Lodge Studios. I just want the, I want the studio to be busy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I want, I want noise to be made here constantly. So if it's bands, if it's artists, if it, I mean, I do a bit of like sound design, um, just keeping, just, just keeping it busy, just keeping it, you know, keeping it noisy in here, mm. basically. So I think it's fair to say then that at points we've both had dreams of being like full-time artists, um, but have had to diversify in order for the music business to pay us a full-time living. Do you think that musicians have to diversify more than ever these days to make a full-time living from the music business? Yeah, I do. And I think we spoke about it loads already. I think it's you, you can't just be Mitch, the drummer from The Milk, mm. do you know what I mean? Or Ollie, the singer for States of Emotion. I think, you know, those who get that wonderful opportunity to to do that are in such the minority. Yeah. That it's such a, like I said, like you can plan for that. And if it don't work, maybe be a, you know, pilot. And if that don't work, <laughs> maybe, you know, go to the moon. And if that don't work, maybe play centre four for West Ham. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's like it's it's too much. There's too much hope in there, man. There's not a lot of there's not a lot there's not enough kind of practical planning of your life. I don't think. So. Yeah, and I feel like as well, um, sort of, you know, 
in, in this sort of modern era, you, you, you have to, as a musician now, do so much more yourself. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, whether that's production or marketing, managing, booking. Um, yeah, musicians have had to become a lot more independent and, and self-sustaining. So, and, and, and although it's a lot more work, um, you actually really like what ends up happening is you have this like um, diverse set of skills. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like if you're just completely fixating on being an artist and just doing, doing those things to serve your own career, unless that has led to, you know, levels of success where it earns you enough to not have to worry about doing anything else and you can just be an artist, which is, as we've uh, said a few times on this, on this episode, a bit of an anomaly, really. Um, it, it seems like a, a waste not to, to, to use those skills that you've developed um, through, uh, that have been a necessity, necessity for building your own uh, project. It seems a waste not to use those in, in, in other areas, other areas. You know what I mean, and offer those things to other artists. Um, and I think it's great as well because we're in a little bit of an ecosystem now where musicians are really just helping musicians more than ever, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? It's not like they've got their team, their label and manager and that over there and fucking artwork guy and they've got theirs. It's like, because it is so much more independent now, we're all sort of mucking in and helping one another in different ways, aren't we? Absolutely, man. And like, I've never felt that more than, than now, like you say. And I think there's such a wonderful new landscape now for, mm. for artists where, you know, you don't have to be fucking, you know, quadruple platinum and, you know, living in LA with some giant mansion with your own private jet or, you know, busking in Camden. There's this wonderful new middle landscape where yeah. you can make a great career, little boutique industry, you know, as long as you, you know, your band's good, your music's good, it's, you know, well marketed, you know, you've got a good product that, you know, people will love. You know, and, you, and you're smart in that sense. You know, there's this whole middle ground where you can live a pretty normal, happy life, but doing what you love doing. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there's a lot more earning opportunities out there, I feel. Um, I've said it a few times on this podcast. It's, it's probably harder than ever to be the next Arctic Monkeys or Oasis, that fucking phenomenon thing. But there are just uh, so many more opportunities out there now to, to reach an audience without a gatekeeper um, and then monetize them. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And earn a few quid as a musician so that you can fund your, your, your project and, um, and pay yourself. Do you know what I mean? When you mm -hmm. get to a certain level. Um, so, yeah, I think it's like the music business has become more um, democratized in that, in that respect, isn't it? And that's yeah. a very good thing. And make the quality of music. I mean, you know, people can talk about the quality of chart music and like the the like the upper echelons of like you know the, the most famous artists and how quality that is. And I'll have that debate with you. But in terms of like a wider like access to like like great music, it's never it's never been better. Do you know what I mean? I mean, if you wind back the clock long enough, uh, wind back the clock long enough. I could never be a producer because, you know, you'd have to wear a lab coat. You'd have to be allowed yeah. into Abbey Road Studios. You know, you'd have a fucking mountain of like Soviet fucking compressors that you need to learn mm -hmm. how to use. Do you know what I mean? There was just, there was that glass ceiling again. Mm. There was no access to it. Similarly with like marketing, it was, there was absolutely, you know, if you didn't know the fucking editor of NME or whatever, you didn't have a relationship with, you know, these publications or, you know, whatever, plug in and getting stuff on like there was, there was too much of this glass ceiling stuff. Yeah. Whereas now you've got a, you can get straight to your fans via, you know, all the great social media stuff that you do, and you can you can start learning how to make records on a laptop in your bedroom. Do you know? Do you know yeah. what I mean? So, you know, like you say, it's going to be harder to become the next, I don't know, Diana Ross, but <laughs> but, you, but you know, you can you can you can make great music and have a great fan base and have a mm. you know leave a bit of a legacy, which is kind of what we're all trying to do, aren't we? We're all trying to leave yeah. a little stamp on the world, you know, of like really great music that you're really really proud of, even though, you know, it didn't fucking go quadruple platinum. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's weird, isn't it? I feel like the culture when we were teenagers and first getting into bands 
was everyone just was like wanting to be the next oasis and and aiming for that and it's weird it's like starting any fucking i don't know like a it's like starting a, a, a small business and expecting to be like fucking this huge major corporation and if you don't become that then you've failed do you mm. know what i mean like imagine like if, put it in football terms imagine if you could, you could only be someone who you know can do a couple of kick-ups or you have to be lionel messi there's there's no yeah. there's no sunday league game there's no you know there's the, imagine there's no middle ground of being like any kind of yeah you know it's like imagine the joy that then goes out goes out of that it's like there's this wonderful new yeah landscape where you can you can thrive and you know i'm all for it mate i'm all for it so what's been your biggest struggle as a musician? Wow, biggest struggle. Um, I should practice more, I know that. I'm a bit of a jack of all trades, as you know, so <laughs> all right on a number so of instruments. So multi-talented well, instrumentalist, yeah, I don't actually, know. Mitch. I don't know. <laughs> I could, um, yeah, I always say to myself every year that I need to dedicate more time to practicing piano, you know, guitar, drums, whatever. Um, the biggest challenges. Uh, I mean, fundamentally, I'm a I'm a one man band in the studio. Currently, um, you know, so it's yeah. There's a certain amount of like isolation I get with like big decisions in my career. But having said that, I always feel like whoever I'm working with on an album or on a project, I really feel like there's a collaborative spirit mm. there. So don't feel too sorry for me. Do you know what I mean? I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, other challenges. Um, yeah, I mean, keeping motivated at times, I suppose, is is another thing. You know, I used to work on a building site, and if you're hungover from the weekend, sometimes you just want to pick up a load of plasterboards and carry <laughs> them over there, <laughs> rather, rather than trying to work out the lyrical content of this fucking thing that yeah. I'm doing. It's like I can't be asked. I think that's um, one of the interesting <laughs> things about being a songwriter and yeah just working in the creative industry like i was talking to um preston from ordinary boys mm. on this podcast uh, a few weeks ago and um we spoke about how his like new gig or most recent gig as, as a writer um for pop artists he'll, he'll go in and like he'll he'll sit with like um you know another writer and the artist say and you know, meet these people, have a cup of tea or whatever, and within half an hour, he's pouring his heart out, writing writing lyrics and stuff, and it's it's pretty fucking intense. You know what I mean? And and like at times, you know, you're really sort of bearing your soul if you're a mm. lyricist. And like you say, if you had a bit of a heavy weekend or you got some fucking life stress or whatever <laughs> that you're carrying that day, or it's it's quite yeah. I mean, it's an intense job sometimes at, at, at the best of times, but mm. to come in and not feel hundred percent. Like you say, there's certain more conventional jobs where you can just fucking get your head down and graft your way get through the day it or whatever. Yeah. yeah, whereas this, um, yeah, isn't like that, is it? I suppose it, another big challenge that's just popped into my head, and again, it should motivate me and it does more, more often than not, in that there's very few industries whereby it's so clear like, like how talented some people who do what you do are. Do you know what I mean? Like we... It's like a league table, like the charts or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Or this, the success of like some other producers and songwriters out there. Yeah. It's like, you know, depending on what mood I'm in, half of me is like, fucking right, I could do that. Let's fucking write mm. one of them. And the other half of me is like, well, how the fuck am I ever going to do that? Yeah. They're so talented. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, what, what are you doing with your life kind of thing? So that can be a challenge sometimes. Yeah, it's Just hard like, not to compare yourself when well, it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, well, it's, it's everywhere. It's major yeah. league producers and artists. Right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, driving to the studio, driving home, it's like, what, what's the first thing you do? You get in the car, you stick the radio on, and you hear like these tunes, and you're like, "Fuck, that's so good, that's so good." Whether it's the songwriting or the production of it, you're just like, "Wow." I don't know. Sometimes it beats you down, and it's mm. like, "Why? Why haven't? Why didn't you come up with that?" You know. But yeah, like I say, it should, and for the most part, it does inspire. You know, we're all music fans at the end of the day, mm. um, so we all love a fucking brand new track, don't we? But yeah, I'm, you know, sometimes you're just like, oh, you bastard! I, <laughs> I, I would have loved to have written that. You know? So, um, what's been the highlight of your career? Would you say? Great question. Um, well, there's this ska band, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's been I mean, loads, that man. That kazoo, mate, was yeah special. Yeah, 
They would never got in the top 40 without that kazoo. Well, to be fair, man, that top 40 was a great achievement <laughs> for us. Do you know what I mean? And like, I was so dead proud of... That was massive, wasn't it? Yeah. You and us and everything that we accomplished, you know. That really was a highlight. Um, yeah, no, no doubt about it. I mean, other massive ones are the, the Milk's um, top 40 album. I think, I mean, you mentioned it at the top, but Favourite Worry, I think, is probably my seminal work. The, like the, Mate, the milk yeah. second album if anyone listening hasn't were hasn't listened to favorite worry by the milk just fucking pause the podcast and go and check that out right now because it is fucking beautiful yeah cheers man <laughs> um but yeah in, in our drunk you know when we're together we're drunk we often wonder whether we are the story of well, what if the Beatles never made it you know <laughs> we're, we're that good but we just know but no one knows no one knows about us um but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still dead proud of that album. I'm, I'm really proud of all the Milk albums. We've got, we're halfway through our fourth one now and that's already sounding pretty special. Um, but yeah, that second one in particular, it got that, you know, it got that recognition from BBC Six, which was really, really good. And um, yeah, I mean, we get, we get a lot of messages about what that's, you know, a handful of those songs on that album meant to people, you know, like serious shit, you know, weddings and people passing away and all this sort of business because fundamentally that album come from a pretty like dark place as a collective anyway. We just ended the Sony relationship, you know, uncertainty, uncertainty was up in the air. Certain relationships were, were, were collapsing for individuals in the band and we managed to capture that alchemy. We, we ended up getting all of, the, all of that kind of raw emotion down on record. I think, and I think you know you can really you can really hear hear it in that. So I mm. mean, definitely a highlight um, is that. I mean, there's there's been loads, man. I could I could I could go on go on and on, but I suppose finally the longevity, you know, staying in it. I I kind of I can't believe I'm still <laughs> still here. Do you know, mm -hmm. both in the you know in the band and in the studio. You know, I kind of thought like ride it till it bucks you, and it and it hasn't yet. So mm. <laughs> here I am. Well, I was uh, I was listening to uh, a podcast um, that Preston did with Scroobius Pip from a few years back when I was researching for the episode we did, and they were both saying how like every year you can make it work and and earn your full time living out out of it is a massive achievement. Do you mm. know what I mean? And should be celebrated. Um, so every year you've not got a normal job is is a huge win. Um, and I really like having that outlook. Do you know what I mean? That was listening to that. I was like, yeah, fucking hell, actually, that is a fucking fantastic perspective to have on 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 being in this business. Yeah, man, staying in the game. And, and, and it comes with that uncertainty. It comes with those financial strains at times. You know, it comes with you know, all sorts of, all sorts of stuff, like the, the extra work ethic that goes into it. Mm. But, you know, staying in the game really is something I'm dead proud of. And um, yeah, long may it continue. I love making music. I still get like crazy excited, like a teenager when me or, you know, a band I'm working with create something in, like great. I still get that same buzz, that high, you know, mm. I, I, you, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Sure, and, yeah. And I fucking love it. And I'm lucky to have that, you know, more frequently than most. So, yeah. Wicked, man. Uh, so last question, mate, is what advice would you give an aspiring musician that's just getting started on their journey? That's the question, isn't it? Um, mm. I would say know your shit. Um, know your instrument, know your craft. Get as good at that, as, good at that as you possibly can as quickly as you can. <laughs> uh, and also, oh, man, I don't know let's be really poetic really, like, on the spot, but like really understand you as a human being, like, you know, music is your output. You know, it's, it's basically, it's an echo of you and your spirit and your soul and fucking make sure it's like tip top. Do you know what I mean? Make sure it's absolutely brilliant and you know, it's brilliant and you've, you've done your homework and you've researched like music and you know, so, so when it comes to that echo, that output, you know, it's fucking excellent. Uh, and if you've, and if you've got that in place, then fucking throw your life into it, you know, especially at a young age, if you've got the, you know, cause you don't have to worry about shit really for the most part. 
you know, if you're lucky enough to have a decent upbringing and stuff, you got, you know, you can throw your 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 early life into it, and it's 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 worth it. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, you can't half ass it, can you? You you've can't half ass it. Yeah, <laughs> you've got to really throw the kitchen sink at it. Just be sick, basically. Just yeah, that's it, really. I mean, that's pretty much pretty much all of it i'd say beautiful stuff mate well look mitch it's been an absolute pleasure uh yeah thank you for taking the time mate love you to bits you too brother nice one love you man <laughs>